way, I mean, but it, we'll both have it in that way in case one of us messes it up. Does it make any difference whether I'm in presentation mode in PowerPoint or regular mode? Like, I don't know what's showing on your screen. Whatever right? this is, it works. This looks oh, fine. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So you just tell me uh, go and I will use my um, announcer voice. <laughs> okay. So hello everyone. Uh, I thank the Arkansas Agile group for uh, allowing me to attend and talk about my journey with Enterprise Agile. I am Rahul Ravel. I'm a program consultant uh, who's been in the project management Agile realm for about 20 plus years. Uh, I'm also working for Nike currently. I've worked at Intel. So I've worked in large enterprise corporations. And so there's definitely, definitely um, a lot of best practices, a lot of areas to avoid when implementing anything at an enterprise scale. And in the time we have here, I'm going to be happy to talk to what about implementing agile as an enterprise scale. A um, little bit about me, I've mentioned about 20 years in high tech, project management, product development, consulting, IT, and letters after my name. I've got Scrum Master, I've got Product Owner, I've got Scaled Agile, Scrum Master, PMP, and ITIL. Um, Agile experience, you know, my, my experience with Agile probably is going about eight years or so. It's really, I think, like a lot of other people. Um, they've worked in a group where they were mandated to start looking at Agile. For me, that was at Intel IT. And as they successively got into other roles, their exposure to Agile might have been increased. That's, that's some of my story here. Um, I've had opportunities to serve as a Scrum Master, serve as a product owner. And this has also been with product teams. It's also been with software teams. Uh, uh, it's actually been with hardware teams. It's working with teams that wanted to incorporate Agile in their project life cycle or product life cycle. And for me, the, the joy has been I've been exposed in where and how Agile works, can work, really doesn't work. Uh, in my current role right now, I've been working uh, in Nike technology operations being a representative to make sure IT operations, um, that those roles and responsibilities are encompassed into an enterprise agile model. A lot of words there, but essentially, um, you do have an overhead of IT operations. Somebody has to manage the servers, somebody has to keep them patched and so forth. Meanwhile, the company is doing continuous development. So there's a lot of implications for my group that I need to make sure get covered in an enterprise agile model. Uh, my personal interest and in some, some things I do in cybersecurity is how do you merge agile practices with the product lifecycle for information security products? When you think of agile, fail early, fail often, well, if you're gonna release security products or processes, failing early and fail off, failing often doesn't always lead to a successful product in industry. So there's modifications that need to be done into a product life cycle where you can pull the right aspects of agile and still be able to deliver a product in there. And so for me, there's just a lot of fascination because of the plethora of products that you have out there in the security space. So that's, that's uh, sort of an overview of my experience, my career. Uh, any questions in any of these areas? Have you primarily worked in an environment with Scrum or have you worked in other like Kanban teams and stuff like that as well? Like what types of teams have you worked with? Yeah, Intel went and had originally adopted the Scrum Agile practice. Um, but uh, when I've developed IT uh, Agile strategies and other IT shops, Scrum didn't readily apply. Like for example, when you're implementing infrastructure, you know, it's hardware, it's a procurement lead time, it's an install. So you, I've applied aspects of Agile to say, we need to have a one world view. Let's set up a Kanban board, let's do a ceremony. So the good thing is, 
there's a lot of, once you understand a full expanse of agile, you can pull those tools out. And so, uh, and, uh, you know, current role at Nike is, you know, in enterprise agile, I'm thinking, how cool is that to see how you would implement something across, you know, teams that are numbering in the thousands? Good question. Okay, I will move on. <clears throat> so, first of all, you know, just the, the mere concept of an agile framework where it's not one team, but here's my team of five and every day we're doing a stand-up. You know, the, the picture down there is, is just tip of the iceberg on what you may see. And so, this is, this is my world every, every quarter. And this is my fourth quarter of working with teams. So um, PI in there, in case you're wondering, it stands for a program increment. If you're not familiar with some of the scaled agile terminology, don't worry about that. But it's essentially where you're going ahead, uh, identifying the requirements as passed down by the product manager. Um, you're prioritizing the backlog. And your teams are actually going in there planning and to some degree actually writing up the user stories, sizing them, and you're doing that in two days. Now, a PI train is uh, essentially, you can think of it as a project team or a specific project, and that project is going to have 10 to 12 scrum teams on there. So when you look at it from a higher level agile uh, uh, unit level, the number of story points can number in thousands. Now, you're in a room with 10 to 12 scrum teams and they're hovered around their Kanban boards and then prioritizing, discussing, they're going through sizing. And then, and this all takes place over 48 hours, by the way, and then somewhere in there, they have to do a pitch back. Now, there's a format that's a uh, scaled agile follow, so I won't go into the details, but Imagine you've got some requirements, you've got all of these scrum teams, they've got to story size them, they have to see what their whip is, what the velocity is, and then they have to pitch it back to their management within 48 hours. And that management for each of those teams has to press the button and say, go. We've understood the risks, dependencies. Any type of program level for that would take me three to four weeks. If I had that many people in a room, I'd be, all right, here's the, here's all the requirements. Here's the stickies. Here's the dependencies. Here's the capacity. Here's the risks. All right, everyone go back for a week, retool, come back, re-engage, and it's 50, 75 people in a room. These are upwards 100 to 200 people, and they're doing it in two days. Now, one of the things that I've, and actually I'll introduce a concept to you. There's a concept of calendar time, and then there's a concept of maturity time. When you think of calendar time, it's exactly what it is. Hey, this program is gonna take three months to deliver. We slipped one month. Hey, we're gonna pull it in one month. Very pretty simple concept. Maturity level, um, you might, uh, Think in terms of, you know, uh, storming, forming, performing. When you think of enterprise agile, it, I think the benefit isn't in a calendar level, it's in a maturity level. And so when I talk about maturity, you know, here's a team that's put together and in calendar time, it might be a year that team meets and sooner or later, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday. Um, hey, let's go out for a happy hour as a team. A good enterprise framework will force that social dynamics. I think some of that is you're in an enclosed room. You know you got 48 hours. You know the work you have to pitch and deliver has to be scoped out and presented. It doesn't allow uh, for a, a lot of wiggle room. And you've got to look at the person to the left and the right to make sure are we in alignment we have to deliver as a team. And so I'm talking 100 plus projects and programs uh, that I've delivered that maturity normally should take a year, year and a half before you get 
to performing and I've seen it in quarters. And so for me, that dynamic, there's a lot of benefits that come around that. It binds the team. It doesn't matter whether it's technical, non-technical, but it keeps the team focused on the planning and the team self-corrects itself. All the things which the Agile Manifesto uh, espouses, it, it provides that, but it's on a scale that's amazing. And the benefit I've had of being sort of my fourth quarter of seeing these PI teams, some of them don't need two days to plan their work and get it modified. Uh, they're doing in a shorter amount of time and it's a quarter's worth of work done, uh, scoped in eight hours, amazing. Uh, I've seen the dynamics from, you know, first day at school, I don't know anyone, hey, who are all the cool kids? Two teams like high-fiving each other, the person walks into the room, it's like, these teams must have been working together for two years. Now they've just been working together for two quarters, three quarters. So that just that part sold me. I know a lot of planning techniques to kick off programs. This was unexpected to me. And so to me, that once you get that maturity level of teams that do want to work together in that fashion, all focus, think of how you scale that across hundreds of teams and that's actually the environment I'm in right now. Questions? So you have uh, two days a quarter that you guys get together to do the big room planning, right? Correct. Um, and, and you said how many teams are in there right now? Is it like when your organization gets large enough to have like, like you said, hundreds of teams, is it ever split yeah. into multiple or is there like how do you make those determinations like how big's too big yeah so there are some boundary conditions around that so just in for in uh and this is i'm speaking more from scaled agile experience uh so roughly you know in 10 to 12 is about a good team size and i think that also is in the normal project realm it really goes up to the the higher level of the organization, what are the major endeavors, the strategic objective that a company wants to take on? And so, and for me, sorry, I have to mind, you know, I have to mentally map out to a large scale enterprise initiative and then the programs coming down to that. So normally a, the initiatives will have two to three programs supporting a strategic objective. And then that pro, uh, those two to three programs will have um, um, the equivalent of what's called a train. If you think of uh, a train, just think of it as a large scale program. So we actually at Nike have, um, I'm, on paper it's 10, but I'm going to say five strategic objectives. And the other five are really teams that are enabling the higher level objectives. I think what I can talk about is time to market. What enterprise doesn't want to accelerate their time to market? Uh, global presence, um, data analytics, uh, big data is a hot area right now. And so you have all these things that do meld in a way to support the higher level objectives. And if I answered my question in there for you. Well, I think somewhere in there, where does it make sense? And I think I've got that, that I can, t I'll, I'll remember your question and see if I can't talk to that in a little bit of a later slide. Cool. Um, okay, so why is an enterprise agile model make sense? Well, first of all, it, it's a global economy. Events can happen dynamically and corporations need to change. When you think, when we talk about events, here's a, international competitor that has just announced a product and by the way they announced it six months before you were going to launch why uh, do we still can continue with that product do we do something different i believe this morning samsung is announcing some new product because phone because they've lost market share and they are coming out with some new capabilities uh, think of a data breach suddenly you have a marketing nightmare on your hands where you know most of millions of your uh, consumers PII have now been hacked and they're now exposed um, uh, you know weather political situations all of these things 
uh, come faster at companies and they need to then react. And then the, the reaction, uh, that also drives at what point do you allow yourself times to pivot? Do you wait until an adverse event happens or do you try to address it in advance? So um, Scaled Agile happened to look at it and say, you know what? We need a runway, we need a period or a lease cycle that's long enough to deliver something of significant value at the enterprise level, but also short enough where we can stop, retrench, do major corrections or minor corrections, and then keep going. They call that unit a program increment, and it just happens to be eight to 12 weeks. Well, strangely enough, it coincides with a quarter calendar period. So that's, a, that's where they time bound it. And so uh, uh, it allows something of value to be driven, but it also allows some um, changes. And so companies are starting to look at how we know that happens at the agile level at a product or such. Can that actually be adopted at the higher level? And hence why you're starting to see um, the proliferation of uh, agile models. Now the challenges, there are challenges. Um, think of you going to the supermarket and you know, you're getting a phone call, I'm not saying anything about significant others, but you get a phone call, hey, you need milk. Okay, great, I'm good with milk. 15 minutes later, 2% milk, got it. 15 minutes later, no, 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 well, I want whole milk. Okay, all good. Hey, can you make that 2% again? All good. So at some point, you get overwhelmed with the communications. So what is it that so communications really is is something that is a challenge where you don't want to introduce that much change that quickly at some point in time you've got the two percent milk you're driving back phone calls nope sorry got the milk we're good well we really needed the other one okay so um, that's something that really needs to there has to be some sensitivity because you are now delivering messages particularly from the top down that are impacting 20 30 50,000 people the communications also need to be made sure that there's a certain agile speak and so you're delivering messages that will always have some value add on the actions that are there I call the actionable items information You've got 20, 30,000 people that are moving along and with the agile continuous delivery focus. So it can't be informational. It should be in the context of stop doing this, start doing this, start looking at this, hold off on, on this. So I think a communications plan really needs to be integral part uh, for agile. Uh, so the teams are course correcting accordingly. The value drop. Um, Value drop. Value driven before a change is uh, showing that the value driven before it's. Oh, so um, uh, it, value drops are used used around industry, but for whatever action you're driven, it could be a value to the business, market share, financial impact, revenue, whatever it is. But some amount of effort has been expended. A lot of times, and I'm sure all of you on the call have had your experiences where, hey, we're stopping this project or this program. Well, we were one month away from delivering final product. Now we decide to stop it. But we invested $2 million. Nope, we're just going to stop it. So while there are course corrections at some point in time, you have to make sure that Teams need to go develop and get that thing of value delivered before they're going to be going in another area. If that value has diminished for whatever reason, then it makes perfect sense to say, hey, just stop that. That new product we were going to go out with, competitors out there, we did quick analysis, we're not going to compete with them, we're just going to shut this project down. Okay, so there's those, those areas where uh, the values don't make sense. Uh, and there's something else in here. Um, because you have so many teams interacting, you might not be able to articulate the value drop because what you're delivering the another team is going to utilize. I am delivering a, a database, high availability database. Well, that isn't going to impact the business 
oh, but here's a team that is doing some e-commerce new initiative. That high availability is going to help that team do seven by 24 hour sales. So it's good to understand that the value drop might not be directly tied to you, but indirectly tied to you that there is some benefit to the business. And then the other challenges, enterprise agile training. Um, as we had talked about earlier, agile is gonna mean different things to different levels, different roles and responsibilities in the organization. What level of agile needs to be delivered to those people to go ahead and move forward with adopting this? Uh, right off the top of my head, Here's a general agile framework. Here's terminology. Here's a stand up. This is what backlog grooming. This is what a scrum master does. I think there should be foundational level for the whole organization so they can start learning the language. When you start looking at development teams, then you probably want to start introducing more scrum, scrum master uh, specific training for product owners. Maybe some things specialized in product owner training, but also uh, writing user stories. And then you can get into other specialized training for estimations and things like that. There's a number of training out there. One of the things that I really uh, emphasize is at the C-suite. Agile is usually driven at uh, the development engineering areas of an organization and you are introducing a framework for decision making that you're, you're introducing a concept that is far more dynamic than what you might be exposed to in terms of uh, corporate objectives, management by objectives, um, phase gate approach. And I'll talk to a little bit about this because if that alignment isn't happening at the top, um, because it's an enterprise initiative, I think a lot of traction is lost at the lower levels, i.e., um, if they're seeing their management on board with that, then it can be assumed that it's, I can opt out. I don't fully have to be on board with this initiative versus seeing their management trained in this. And it also gives the management a little bit more feeling of empowerment because now they're understanding an agile framework and can speak with that language to all levels of the organization. Questions here? Makes sense. Okay, move around. So yes, agile training for the C-suite. That's your CIO, CXO, CISO, and such. Really, yeah, so I thought this was interesting. This was something that I didn't believe that somebody actually had done some research uh, on it. And the key thing is um, most of an organization um, views the CEO as the biggest proponent for organizational agility. I, in my experience, when I was rolling out Agile strategy, made sure I had a C-level sponsor. Otherwise, if it wasn't C-level, I would have said, here's a paper exercise, but I don't think you're going to be successful as implementing it. So if you're having that role of the CEO being the biggest driver of change, then then it makes a little bit more sense to make sure that CEO is trained and versed in the language of agile, that he understands it enough that in a CEO role, he can drive initiatives down. He might be exposed to, here's a portfolio Kanban, and here's these corporate initiatives, and we are going to groom those and give those a priority order. That can take place with a scrum master developing a mobile app. Why can't it scale up to a CEO who's working at the corporate objective level. So to me, this was very a very uh, telling fact. I thought it would be good to share. So, um, and along with the Agile framework, again, that annual corporate planning cycle, we're gonna plan, we're gonna do for the coming year, and we're gonna assume nothing drastic happens in the world, and we're gonna continue moving forward. Now it's changing it into quarterly where CEOs have to understand what are the dynamics, what are the changes that they want to do, should do, can do, uh, to and then drive those changes on a quarterly basis. Um, 
in identifying the agile concepts and how does it translate into development teams? The concept of Kanban boards will flow all the way down from CEO to development teams. What's on that Kanban board and the phases it use will likely be radically different, but how cool would that be for a CEO walking by to walk in by an engineering team and say, huh, looking at the Kanban board, wow, you guys got a lot of stuff sitting in backlog. Your, your whip is kind of low. What's the matter? Yeah, we've got some resource constraints on there. Will that increase your whip? Yeah. Um, why don't you talk to your manager, tell them to give me a couple of headcount requests. To me, that's Nirvana where you have top-down, bottom-up understanding of Agile. And it also drives other things where, you know, the risks uh, uh, whip other things that can then help them remove those barriers. Um, and then uh, things that are non-agile terms, it also should be driving a data dictionary or master, a master data of what are the terms that a, the enterprise should be agreeing to. So there's all types of things in risk levels. Uh, there's a lot of term with minimum viable product. Um, I find I get confused in my current environment, the concept of a product. Uh, some teams look at that and, and say, oh, a product, it's this bundle of capabilities. We've got a product owner and they're doing the deliver it. But if they're dealing with uh, the people that deal with apparel and footwear, a product, oh, that's our new Nike React shoe. That's a product two different mindsets on what exactly a product's defined. And so I think this also drives the need for some type of internal corporate wiki uh, on that terminology. Again, it's the non-agile terminology. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I've also seen, uh, what is your thoughts on, or is there a difference in your mind talking about uh, some of that terminology like an MVP versus a minimum marketable product. Like, have you seen people kind of split hairs on that? Is there a big difference? What are you, what are your thoughts on? Yeah. Well, even the concept of MVP, you know, uh, can be broad to definition uh, there. I, I think, uh, you know, all of this stuff needs to be defined with some owners. Otherwise, um, is it the minimum engineering product? Is it the minimum reference uh, thing? And this is where, because Agile is, it moves so fast through an enterprise, the last thing you want to do is say, hey, everyone, we're going to deliver an MVP, and it means something different. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of requirements, a lot of understanding, a lot of who is the specific owner that is defining what this thing is. And so I, um, I think most corporations really don't have to worry about that. But as you're getting, you're starting to drive higher and higher velocity, then I think that would surface a problem that normally wouldn't, that there's got to be consistency in some of these terms. Right. Hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, so a little bit more like scaled agile. So I, you know, I'd been looking at scaled agile uh, before I'd gotten to Nike, and I said, all right, what is this thing called scaled agile? And I looked at it and I said, you know, I this, if I understand it correctly, there's little bits and pieces of things that just look very familiar to me. So I actually spent some time in deconstructed scaled agile and found out that. There's a lot of underlying concepts that have, that help me mentally map out to this, you know, fairly busy slide that has terms like, you know, an agile release train and a solution architect and uh, and what's the difference between that and the system architect and so on and so on. And so I call it the classic program artifacts at the top. Your program portfolio does align to management by objectives. There is some prioritization uh, involved where there's um, uh, some weighted scorecards or portfolio review. And then you can see through the rest of the slide, artifacts, certain roles lend themselves to what is happening in, say, classic waterfall program manager. So ultimately, 
there's not too much of a radical change between a waterfall program and an agile program. It's just where and how the decision making and where and how those increments of delivery are happening. And we already had talked about happening at a faster velocity where, hey, we're in planning and it's going to take two months to, to plan. And then we've got a tool of factory up, which might be another two months. And then we're going to start our manufacturing, which will go for a year or so. So, um, so that there are those differences in agile, but um, I, I found out that a lot of the concepts um, already were known to me. And once I understood a, uh, that there was a familiar concept, then I could understand that context. What was that? artifact or that role supposed to deliver and it was pretty much similar. There are a few things and this was scaled agile, I think 4.0, so they're at four or five now. I don't think I think five is in discussion. And for me it's a capacity plan. Now these are Rahul's opinions here. The capacities plan assumes that because you're continue doing continuous integration delivery, you are always your resources are always at maximum capacity and so there'll be vacations it'll be summertime it'll be holidays and your capacity will uh, grow diminish but you adjust your whip for that capacity plan I, I think that you still need to understand the capacity um, as as a parallel exercise um, otherwise teams will spend too much time underestimating, overestimating, and it's great if you are delivering a mobile app, but at an enterprise level, you know, are you gonna overestimate 50,000 people? Are you gonna underestimate 50,000 people? That has way too much impact on your manufacturing, product delivery, and even revenue. Um, the phase gates, you know, the, well, we talked about, hey, at the end of your program increment, at the end of the quarter, you're already doing a start, stop, continue. So Rahul, where's the issue with the, the phase gates being in there? I think there really needs to be a lot more rigor around those decision processes. So um, in the defense of scaled agile, they say it's a framework. You need to have some decision at the top we're not going to tell you what the best decision making process is. You need to figure out what that need is for your enterprise. So I believe that, you know, the a phase gate, which I really like, there has to be a lot more diligence on that for then those decisions to then be driven downward there. And then the post train value drop. So think once you deliver something at the end of a quarter, it, we talked about the value drops happening, but in certain cases, if something we're going to roll out a program and we've launched a new sneaker. Great. We have this absolutely cool new sneaker, LeBron James, Michael Jordan. The value of it wasn't happening once we release the sneaker. The value is in we start seeing consumers doing their purchasing. So sometimes you can go all the way through, but the value isn't fully realized until you've got a product out there. And then you hope that all your marketing demand and forecast was in place. So that's one of the things that the, the enterprise framework is. You're always delivering some continuous value. The reality of the situation is some of your value isn't going to be realized until it's used or it starts to ramp up and such. And so that's something that I think is probably uh, missing that they, that's a, a little bit more of a risk when adopting an enterprise agile approach. Any questions? So is uh, what other options have you looked at as far as scaling goes with doing the agile practices at a larger scale? Has it just been safe or have you looked at other ways of doing that? Yeah. So there are, uh, oh God, there's, there's, uh, less, there's dad, there's a couple of other flavors of agile out there. Um, I think scaled agile, uh, has the most momentum around it. It's the, you know, it's got the scaled agile group behind it, Dean Leffingwell. 
it's got templates, it's got roles, responsibilities, it's got consultants. Um, I think it's the most mature, but it also is the one that take the most investment. When I've done a uh, larger scale agile strategy for um, medium sized company, 500 people companies, uh, then I will pull out elements from agile that makes sense for them to deliver their work. I'll introduce, uh, I might not need scrum masters, um, but I will align it with project managers, but I will introduce product owners. Um, I'll introduce Kanban boards, but not a physical Kanban board. I might do ceremony. So in those cases, um, it's a little bit more crawl before you run type of an agile approach. Uh, the, the, all of these enterprise frameworks, if we think of your basic agile down here as an agile train, your scrum teams, all of these enterprise, it starts driving the agile approach upward. This is all your C-level suite at the top. Mm -hmm. And so um, those teams, um, you know, management by objectives was something that Intel had done. Uh, I didn't know what Nike had used. So you already have some good decision-making frameworks. And so you're asking about, you know, agile at the level, you know, at an enterprise level. Um, it means to me, it means that you are, you are disrupting something that isn't quite giving the agility that that company needs at that given time. Hmm. And so, and this is one of the, the things where if you're going to introduce a disruptive, you know, framework to something that they have had classical wise, um, you're having to change a lot of mentality, tools, processes, and such. And so there's some risk with doing that. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if you heard of anyone using um, Kanban to do the scaling, because in my study with Kanban, it is um, definitely an option to do at that top level, basically. Oh. Um, so you can just do more Kanban. Yeah. You essentially do Kanban throughout versus a particular framework around the Kanban system. If you went that approach, have you heard of that before? Yeah. So, um, bi-monthly, there is a Portland, uh, Portland portfolio manager forum. There's about 30 of us that have all been project portfolio, you know, director level, VP level, yeah. senior people, people that, you know, uh, I don't need to go to a PMI chapter to learn about a new way to do a risk register. And these, these peers of mine are operating, you know, doing project portfolios and, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And when I look at them to answer your question, they're the ones that, you know, I've had discussions on them. And when they're dealing with volume, number of projects, yeah, Kanban is an element that they'll pull out and drive with their senior execs. At the lower levels, they might use something beyond a Kanban, but to be able to do, to be able to um, implement a framework. Here's a, here's a Kanban. Here's a portfolio. Here's here's uh, here's what's in backlog. Yeah, they're pulling that out now. So there are there are elements where they're using that all the way through an organization. I think it depends on the organization. Where at some point, if they've got a formal PM discipline, you know, the Kanban's then trans start translating into a classical like Microsoft Project Gantt driven chart. I found with senior management, that's, this is a wonderful element for me to say, you know, we're, we're not working on this. We are working on this. This thing is done. So right. back to, uh, I don't, I, I don't think I can easily walk around and show you some of the physical Kanban boards that I've gotten set up working with various teams. Cool. And, you know, when you think about it, I mean, how, how simple is it to explain? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not working on it. I'm working on it. And here's the projects. And uh, by the way, these 15 we're working on, here's some priority number. You can add a few other little tweaks to it. In fact, here's one of my pet peeves, one of several. If you go on Amazon and try to find a good kit <coughs> for uh, a Kanban board, if you got a large whiteboard or a wall, it's pretty sparse. I think there's one company 
that will have the tape and here's the cards and here's like magnetic cards and such. So I don't know, it seems like it's begging for a business opportunity to have far more robust, you know, Kanban in a box products out there, but it's, it's woefully sparse. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery, is that something that you're all relatively familiar with? If not, then I can just take 60 seconds out. And... <laughs> I am, but yeah, feel free to go ahead and go into it. Okay, so you know, uh, you know, the concept of DevOps is relatively new. What three, four years about as a role responsibility uh, there, and even this, uh, you know, a lot of the agile development has been driven by you know a lot of the you know we're a digital world, we're a software world. But <clears throat> one of the things that when we look at again at an enterprise level, it's not DevOps. There's a lot of implication to a lot of teams, and this is some of the things that I've seen start to surface now. And there have been a few cases where, hey, there was a product out the door and it had to be rolled back because somebody forgot to say, shouldn't we have corporate security kind of doing a code scan, doing some pen testing, doing something on this thing before we release to the public? So. I don't think when a lot of business groups are looking at driving a product forward with a lot of focus on here's value drops, that there is an overhead price that you have to pay. And I say those people that have carried a hot pager that have gone off in two o'clock in the morning because a system went down will understand the overhead of uh, maintaining an application. If you've done, and this is, I'm thinking back, reflecting back to my days as an IT manager. Oh, look, it's the second Sunday of the month. It's patching Sunday. Yay, there goes my Sunday. Okay, here's the servers. We're going to take half offline. We're going to patch them, reboot them, validate them. Then we're going to do the other half. And so all those things don't often come up unless you have had a DevOps person or a team of people that are doing the sustaining operations in a room as these teams are developing things. And I believe they would drive things like, is your application highly available? What does that mean? Let's get somebody in here, let's review your application architecture. So some of these things, patching cycles. You know, If you have an OS, you are gonna be patching for security, you're gonna be patching for performance optimization. I'm pretty sure all of us on the call here, you know, here's, here's my phone, okay. Here's a here's a, a software update that's going to be a 200 megabyte download, but you know what? I'm likely going to do that to keep my my you know phone running optimally. Audit compliance that can be very disruptive um, if there's a rollback. The amount you know, and I can argue there's tools, well, Rahul, tools that are doing rollbacks. Yeah, but if you do a rollback. I'm pretty sure that somebody's going to do a check on why did you do a rollback and there has to be some accountability up to management and then there has to be some remediation to make sure a rollback doesn't occur in the future and so there is a cost you have to pay for a rollback and so even though the technology may be able to do it in minutes there's still an overhead that you that happens on an organization um, you're putting more and more stuff out there how are you monitoring all this stuff? And when you think of, uh, of applications, I, I use a Mars approach. I've got to monitor something, and then based on a certain event, it has to get alerted to something. Then I have to decide how I'm going to respond to something, and then I have to secure that something. It could be a defect in application logic. It could be a security hole. So as you go through all of these things, think of it, somebody has to have a role responsibility that they are now having to address more and more of these. And even the people that might have all these wonderful tools that are doing the releases, at some point there is a human element of fatigue that sets in. So at some point in time, your value drop of releasing you know, these new applications and new capability, there's an overhead that doesn't often get looked at and scoped out that says, now this application will require a new DBA, 
We need to add somebody new to the DevOps team. We've introduced a new security capability for the cloud. We need a cloud security person and so forth. So those are the things that I caution that, you know, run forward, run fast, be agile, but also make sure that the overhead to support it, again, at an enterprise level, isn't going to start introducing a human element of fatigue. You're not going to start getting a lot of overhead costs because then you have to get maybe new tools to go ahead and do the management. Uh, and then you might be increasing ed count. And all of these things at an enterprise level might suddenly drive you into the several hundreds of thousands of dollars or even million dollars to go ahead and maintain these things. Questions, yeah. comments? I'm hoping a lot of this stuff is probably stuff that, you know, you on the call have already had some uh, experience or exposure with in some of your own development. I have quite a bit, uh, not to necessarily the scale, but yeah, definitely mm -hmm. hit pieces and bits and pieces of it throughout for sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of those things, it's uh, the same way when I talk about some of the things when I'm talking to clients about the things that I talk about, where it's, you know, this is something that at the high level, it's very simple, but it's not trivial, nor is it always obvious some of the things you have to think about, right? Like it's, it's very something... Um, same thing with the agile stuff. You know, you're talking about it before. Kanban's very easy to help people understand, but it's not always easy to implement, right? It's easy maybe to understand, yeah. but not always easy to break us out of those bad habits that we get into sometimes when we're doing things what we think is the right way. But yeah, yeah very cool. Yeah, it's it's an Kanban. It's an artifact, but guess what? It needs a st ceremony, stand up, and it needs a role. I need people to attend the stand up, and so yes. So there is an overhead, and I think any, you know, um, um, not developers, people who have done L2, L3 support and development, uh, like I said, people who have carried a, a hot pager that knows the, or have run teams of support people, I think they get this, and having them uh, early on in the teams, and we're not talking just for software-related, I think there's a overhead with any capability uh, that you're releasing, more so if your company's going through a digital transformation, that if you take these elements into account, they're not going to come and bite you later on. It may slow things down a little bit, but I think it, ultimately you're, you're operating a little bit more efficiently. I'm trying to think whether on my next, uh, oh yeah, so. Okay. So that's some of the things taking into account the questions to ask to say, if we're going to continuously deliver, how much of this stuff is going to start growing as a overhead till it starts becoming impactful. So tools, um, the alignment of tools, uh, this is going to force an alignment of tools to make sure that the data being collected is of value in the time frame that the person needs to go ahead and do that. Um, I, I was doing some research and uh, it was interesting, OKRs, objectives, um, oh God, uh, key, not key deliverables, I can't believe I just spaced out on it. Help me here on the, on the phone, guys. Um, OKR. Uh, Isn't it key results? Key objectives, key results. I thought the R was standing for something else, but we'll go with the objectives and key results. Um, so um, I was just saying, all right, what are the latest objective and key result tools out there? And I said, oh, okay, there's a few of them there. I knew for a fact that there were a ton of CI CD tools. When I looked at this, I just had to start laughing because this is the technology. It's cool. We can automate this. We can script this. We can release this. So we're really good on doing the, the continuous release. But at the top level is that, you know, you're, you have tools that you don't have as many tools there. And for me, the disparity is you don't have to worry about this continuous release and delivery as much as people may think just because the tools allow you to. This is where I would go back and say, all right, 
uh, rather than continuously release, why don't we queue up the releases and we might have a broader impact on the market if we understand management objectives better. And so I would also look at the tools because at the enterprise level, are you using one set of tools for managing your, your objectives and key results? Are you using a enterprise level agile tracking tool? And then what are your tools for doing CDI, you know, just delivering execution? Once you're delivering something that should back all the way up the food chain to say, we have delivered this thing of value, which is getting us closer toward our corporate objectives. And are you having some set of tools that do the alignment for doing that? And so if you're implementing enterprise agile solution, I would strongly look at the tools. And this is something that I've seen from the overhead, the number of tools that are there for reporting that um, we're not using the, the native tool for reporting. So we've had to use a Tableau or an Aptio and you know Excel spreadsheets. Your tool maintenance just to track if you're achieving your objectives um, goes against the grain of we've got this agile, we should just be doing continuous delivery, but wait, we can't validate that until I run this report, which I have to pull from this tool, and then I need to take data from this one. And so that's one thing that I would also uh, look at because you might be incurring a lot of overhead. Now, some of these agile tracking tools, I'm working with version one right now. Version one was the most phenomenal uh, Kanban tool, and then they had to make it into an enterprise tool, and it is cumbersome. And next week I'll be going to, to one day of training and I might take on, I might go to the training a second time a day later just to make sure I fully understand how it all integrates where ultimately the roll up at a high level, when you talk about an enterprise portfolio level, that I can understand in my program based on the burn down of six different scrum teams, did we actually make a dent? toward that objective and how much overhead do I need to do where I would expect a simple Kanban tool. I can push a button, there's my burn down, that's where I'm at. So um, all these tools have capabilities, they can overlap, you know, it's, uh, you know, I would, I would say on paper, what is it that you need to have the tool do? Functionality, reporting, and then go look at the tool and then see which tool actually has the biggest spread of capability, which means, all right, we can get more efficiency. A lot of times when people go look at tools, it's very narrow into what does that one tool need to do? And they don't look at it as what does that tool do across the board and set of requirements? Let me pause here. Questions? And, uh, Open source, ooh, it's real easy to get sucked into open source tools. How much is it gonna cost you? Free? I love free, let's bring it in. Oh, but that tool doesn't quite align with this other tool that we have to pay licensing for, so. But it's interesting, the, the disparity that's there. Yeah, and, and Microsoft's recently opened up the DevOps space as well with their rebranding of Visual Studio Team Services Online to be what is it called now? Azure DevOps or whatever. And so yes. like they're, they're trying to be the same type of hub, right? They'll pull code from anywhere and push code to anywhere deployments and everything. They are very agnostic, which is not normal for Microsoft. So they've really changed the game as well. They're, they're trying to push everyone else forward, which is good. I mean, having more people in the game instead of just Jenkins is always good to have multiple yes. competition. I've uh, attended some of the Azure days here at campus when, when Microsoft came down and AWS days and the number of supporting tools for your development environment really gets you sucked into those environments. And to some degree, they do actually have a lot of good reporting capability. But again, it's that, you know, if you're in there delivering software, if you're having other, you know, your manufacturing line, so then you have your ERP, when you have a number of other systems, how are you going to allow the agility to be simple enough to show exactly what progress have you made toward those corporate objectives? And heaven forbid you've got to implement, here's my cloud solution that I have to pull something from my ERP solution, and here's my enterprise agile tracking solution, and so it, it then starts becoming mercury or mercury, mercury, 
because you've got to figure out some integration with these tools to provide a data report that makes sense. Yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't remember if this was my, oh yes. Well, look at that. We're at my Q and A uh, section here. So um, in, in summary, uh, it's been, uh, you know, uh, maybe two years, about a year I'd been looking at enterprise agile frameworks off and on the past year. I think it was uh, one week into Nike. My, my new boss said, Hey, you know, you know stuff in, and we hired you cause you know, agile, uh, why don't you go build a scaled agile strategy? Okay. I'm one, I'm one week at Nike. I just want to know where the employee store is so I can go get some, <laughs> some new sneakers. <laughs> um, but it's been a real interesting, uh, journey. And a lot of these things, you can read a lot of things, you can talk to a lot of people, but until you see the ramifications of, we didn't do this back here, fast forward a couple of months or a quarter. And it's like, Oh, there's a challenge there. I think there's a lot of benefits implementing an enterprise agile strategy, but a lot of the symptoms I've seen when you're trying to force a new ERP system or anything else at an enterprise scale, there's technology, there's processes, there's the human element, there's training, there's C-level support. Um, I don't think it's really any different from any enterprise agile initiative or any enterprise initiative that's out there. I think one of the, the, the challenges are you're trying to do things faster. You want to get that whole corporation, that battleship turned a lot faster. And it takes a lot of effort. It's a long journey to get a corporation where it's actually humming on, on all levels. The scaled agile guys might say, you know, uh, might take a year or two. Yeah, I'm thinking that's probably underestimated. 